Hi everyone, it's Joe here from Lawn Solutions Australia and welcome to this episode of Turf Talk where we're live from the Lawn Solutions Global Turf Conference on the sunny Gold Coast where I'm joined by an international guest, uh, Brandon Eubanks, who is the Executive Vice President of SuperSod. Brandon, welcome. Hey, thanks Joe. Thanks for having me. So, all the way from the US, uh, first time to Australia, you got yeah. here a couple of days ago? Yeah, first time to Australia, still fighting a little bit of jet lag, then uh, I'm on day four now. Okay. Yep. Okay, yep. and where, whereabouts did you come from? Yeah, so I'm actually from middle Georgia, a small town called Perry, Georgia, which is right in the middle of Georgia, which is in the southeast part of the United States. Okay, and you're the, like I said, the executive vice president of SuperSod. Now, SuperSod, uh, for those who haven't heard of it, is quite a large turf production business in the US. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about SuperSod and what you do there? Yeah, absolutely. So SuperSod as a, as a whole is a really old company, uh, patent seed company actually started back in the 1800s, late 1800s um, with a general store. And then uh, we started selling seed uh, and producing our own seed, manufacturing our own seed. And then that led into sod production and producing sod. And then today, uh, we actually operate in five different states, so Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Alabama, uh, and we have multiple farms in each of those states, and we provide turf grass, seed, and our organic compost in all of those states. Wow, so turf grass, so that's predominantly, I guess, would that be the main part of the business would it at the moment? Yeah, the, the majority of the business as far as from a revenue stream is yeah. turf grass. Yeah, but the, the compost is growing significantly um, as well as the seed, seed process as well. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we can actually sell all the seed we can produce right now. Right. So there's a huge okay. market for that. And we're mainly warm season turf grass. Yeah. Uh, the only markets that we do cool season turf grasses are in Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, and in North Carolina. Right. So yeah. before... Before we get into turf grass, which we'll obviously focus on, I've been lucky enough to go to your farm in Middle Georgia there, yeah, yeah. Uh, just just kind of recently, and your organic composting process was something that blew my mind. So tell us a little bit about that, how you got into that, and how you make the stuff. Yeah, so we got into it about 10 years ago, uh, and it was uh, somewhat of an, of an experiment. Uh, ben Copeland, our CEO, and uh, Tate Reddick, who actually works uh, at the office with me in Middle Georgia, uh, kind of put their heads together and said, you know, with the poor soil quality that we have in the southeast, mainly being sandy or clay soil, um, we needed something that partnered really well with our main product, turf grass, uh, to give folks a better starting point, uh, specifically with their soil conditions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they got to playing around with, with different types of uh, compost and mixing and making compost. So it was really just started out as an experiment in a dry corner, uh, right next to one of our fields where our seed plant is actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, we've been doing that for about 10 years now. And that has actually grown to be a significant business for us yeah. and a significant part of our revenue stream. And it really matches up well with our main product, turf grass. And so today uh, we're on about a 25, 30 acre site and we just opened up another satellite site uh, up in Northeast Georgia, if you will, uh, because we just, we've outgrown what we can sell yeah, right. uh, from a production standpoint. And so we had to move into a, a different satellite location to produce more. Yeah. Um, we've also had to upgrade our equipment, get bigger and better equipment so that our wind rows can be bigger and bigger. Um, so just to kind of give you an example, what you saw when you were there in middle Georgia, um, our wind rows are 700 to 750 feet long. Wow. And we typically have 60 to 80 at any one time. Yep. Uh, they're 12 feet wide, 10 to 12 feet tall. So these are significantly sized uh, wind rows that we produce. And it takes us a good three to five months, depending on moisture content and heat, uh, to cook out any contaminants and things like that to get that compost made. And then we bag it. We sell it in large bags, one ton bags. And then we sell it in like uh, one cubic foot bags, which are the smaller bags, weigh about 30 to 40 pounds. Uh, that we sell to the retail customers at our stores. And obviously everything's bigger in the US, bigger population means means more customers, but yeah. how many of these bags do you sell annually now? Yes, yeah, so this year we'll probably do somewhere between 55 to 60,000 cubic yards wow. of material. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And about 
10 to 15 percent of that will be in the mini cubes and then the rest will actually be in the big one ton bags that's our biggest seller and the plan is basically someone buys a couple of pallets of turf they get a bag or two of this stuff in their set yeah 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 so we do a bad spot eraser is kind of what we branded one of our products as and so the customer can go in and they have tiff tough or Xeon or whatever they have and they have a bad spot in their yard, they can order a bad spot eraser and right. they actually get a bag of compost, a large bag of compost along with their pallet of sod and we deliver it together yep. as, a, okay. as a combo. Yeah, yep. uh, it's incredible seeing this sort of stuff and the innovation yep. that's involved with it, the equipment that's involved with it, it's quite an investment, so it's quite yeah. to see it. And it's, you know, like I said before, it's, it's really there to help the customer. We're trying to help that customer give them the best start possible and that comes with having really good soil conditions to put that grass in. Yeah, as we know, the turf's just a pretty stuff on top. It's all down to that yeah. top four inches. That's right. Uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. where that root zone room. is, yep. you've got to take care of the root zone, zone for oh, sure. Great. It's great. Now, moving away from that onto, uh, onto turf grass, so... You're 100% warm season turf grass on farm? Uh, so everything in Georgia, Alabama, and South Carolina is warm season. Mm -hmm. In North Carolina and Tennessee, we're cool season turf grass. We'll grow some fescue tall. Okay. Yep. Yep. Elite tall fescue there. And, and, you, and your main warm season grasses, what are they generally? Yeah, so we sell more Tiff Tough than anything, obviously. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. we can definitely get into that. But yeah, yeah. we sell Tiff Tough. We still have some Tiff Way available at some of our farms. Yeah. Uh, we sell Zenith Zoysia, Compadre Zoysia, uh, Centipede, Tiff Blair Centipede is what we sell. We don't sell any common centipede. Yeah. Um, and then we have Xeon, of course. And Xeon. Which so you call Sagrange. Sagrange, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And just to give people a bit of context, so a turf farm in Australia, uh, let's say a big turf producer in Australia, a big day would be 200 pallets of turf. Like, that's a big day. Right. right? That's yeah. our, well, everyone's all hands on deck getting that done. Mm -hmm. What's a typical day at Super Sod across the business and what's your biggest day? Yeah, so a typical day for us, if we're in the spring, summer season is going to be around 3,000 pallets as a whole. That's for all seven locations uh, where our farms are located. Um, but on a really big day, our biggest day was actually April of this year. We did 53 acres of turf grass in one day. So we, we cut and shipped. 53 acres on a Monday. I believe it was April 13th. I think I had to go back and look at that, but yeah. 53 um, acres. 53 acres in one day. Yeah. And that was a long day. I bet it was. We, we broke a lot of stuff <laughs> on that day, but we got it done. All right, yeah, 53 acres. You're cutting out mid-sized Australian turf farms just yeah. in a day. Yeah. 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 And, you know, just to give you an example, our two largest farms um, in Orangeburg, South Carolina, and then the farm that I'm at in middle Georgia, we both on that day cut over 1,200 pallets. Wow. Uh, we do 500 square feet per pallet. So Yeah, so 50 square meter pallets for those that are right. roughly That's right. conversion That's is right. there. So, and the, the super sod business itself, um, how many acres across the business of, of active turf production? Yeah, so as far as turf, turf production goes, we're, we're a little over 13,000 acres okay. yep. um, of turf production. And then we've also got some production as far as the compost plant for inputs there as well, yep. uh, land that we lease for things like that. Okay, yep. and again for context, so you're about 13,000 acres of turf production. Mm -hmm. I think that might be the same as or just more than the entire Australian turf industry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you go. So yeah, and like we were talking like, earlier, you know, yeah. population plays a big part in that. In yeah. the five states in which we revolve and do business, there are 45 million people yeah, okay. just in those yeah. five states in the southeast. Yeah, yeah. so, so it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a massive market. And, and I was blown away by this when I was over there. So our average order uh, in Australia, the average turf order is about a pallet, about 50 to 60 square mm -hmm. meters. In middle Georgia, what would your standard order size sort of be? Yeah, so our, our standard out of directly ship out of our farm is around 16 pallets is what we typically see. You to know, the one customer. Right, to yeah. one customer. But you know, as a whole, if you look at our stores, we have over 20 stores in the five states in which we uh, do business in. If you kind of lump everything together, our average order size is about six to eight pallets per okay. order. Yeah. 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 Because we, we do sell a lot of single rolls and tin rolls and things like that at the mm -hmm. store level. Yeah, right. So so explain that the the sales channel a little bit more to us here. So you do sell direct to end user, but you also go through stores. Now, these are retail yards, essentially, where people can go and look at turf, make their selection, and buy turf from the shop. Correct. Yeah, so at, at all of our stores, even at some of our farms that are near metropolitan areas, we have stores. And so, like I said before, we, we have over 20 stores in total. Super and, sod stores. Yeah, super yes. sod stores. We own those stores. That's correct. Yeah. And and as far as those stores are concerned, what, what customers find when they go there is we try to have every variety, all seven varieties of grass that we grow. And in the warm season, turf is six. Uh, we try to have all the varieties that we grow at the farm and, and we'll have available for the customer there for them to see. So we have plots out front yeah. um, 
that the customer can, you know, believe it or not, they love to take their shoes off and walk through yeah, them because this could be what their lawn could be like. Yeah. Um, so it's a great, great way to showcase to the customer exactly what they could get from Supersod. Yeah. Then as they go inside, we have a sales counter with sales folks and a manager staff there at the store. Yeah. We also have uh, lift drivers that load the customers. And then we, we sell other things like chemicals, fertilizers, mm-hmm. and things like that, along with our compost and seed. Yeah, sure. Sure. It's a whole of house operation. You just right. walk and grab grass. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what we're trying to design and what we what we believe we have designed is a is a place where the homeowner and even the landscaper can go for all of their turf needs. Yeah, yeah, sure. So oh, that's a great overview of the of the super sod business. We'll get back into that a little bit more later on, but just on yourself. So how did you get? Um, we'll start with this. How did you get to where you are today? I guess what has been your journey yeah. in the turf industry, and then go through a little bit about what your role entails. Yeah, day to sure. Day. Yeah, a journey. A journey has definitely been. Um, so I actually don't have a turf turf grass degree or horticulture degree or anything like that. Um, worked uh, at a rental construction equipment company for a couple of years and. Um, Met with a couple of guys there at Superside um, that that I knew, and, and they asked me to to consider coming into the business. Um, and so initially started out working in a really really small office there in Middle Georgia with just two other folks. And you know back then that was 17 years ago. Back then it was, you know, here's a price list and here's a uh, encyclopedia of grass, which was just a little pamphlet that we had. Yeah. Re- read this and yeah. you know answer the phone and sell some grass. Um, and that was back in 08. 09, uh, right as we were going into the uh, great financial crisis, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was able to, to stay on and, and stick with it um, and eventually moved into outside sales. Spent the majority of my career with Supershot in outside sales, um, traveling really all over the state of Georgia, uh, just looking for job sites and landscapers that I could better service. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- did that a good, good portion of my career. Uh, towards the end of that, I spent more and more time on the production side and obviously being there at the same office with Ben Copeland, our CEO, yep. and just trying to get as much knowledge from him about the overall business as possible yep. as he was pouring that information into me and I was I was learning more about the production side of the business. Um, as he moved on to be CEO of the company, I moved up to be the manager there as far as from an operational standpoint mm-hmm. uh, there at that farm in middle Georgia. Yep. Um, and then... From there, I've, I've taken on some other things as far as um, you know, business strategy, things like that, mm-hmm. uh, pricing strategies, um, inventory strategies, yep. um, and also working along with the finance team and Josh Morrow, our COO, to develop some models as far as what do we need as far as inventory goes and conversions of fields and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're also in the midst of you know working on expanding the SuperSod brand and what that looks like is you know, more stores and where should we put those stores? Yeah. And, and with more stores, we need more farms. Uh, we need more turf and we, we need more land. So, you know, trying to model things out um, yeah. like that. And then here recently, uh, the most recent uh, endeavor, if you will, is uh, the logistics of the company, which is a really big undertaking. As you can imagine, being in five states, um, having that many farms that spread out and that many stores that you're trying to provide yeah. grass for, it's a it's a pretty big undertaking. The just the logistics of our business, um, which is just so necessary in the movement of the turf. Well, when you break it down, and I think we might have spoken about this before, turf farms are unique because they're not just agricultural businesses, they're not just trucking businesses, they're not just sales businesses, they're not just marketing businesses. They're all this under the one roof. So, mm-hmm. like you and yourself, it'd be a it'd be a large logistics company to manage without the turf side of things, even That's wouldn't correct. it? Like we're yeah. talking a lot of trucks and a lot of drivers and a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're over a hundred company truck drivers, and then we supplement in with independent truck drivers during peak season, and we could be running, you know, anywhere between thirty to fifty in any given day. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a lot of activity, a lot goes into that. And and your day to day work now, I guess, is your in a nutshell, is it overseeing everything just on the Middle Georgia farm? Is it or yeah, just on the Middle Georgia farm, and then really focusing on that logistics piece, and then yep. you know bits and pieces of the of the business strategy side and the pricing side. Always keeping an eye on that. Yeah, sure, sure. And and your the customers you service is, is are you a retail business at heart? Are you or are you sports turf or a bit of everything? Or yeah, we do a little bit of everything. I, I would say you know our our bread and butter, the the mainstay of our business 
business, if you will, is what we call a wholesale landscaper. And that's that landscaper that's going in and doing some yard renovation or yep. someone just put a pool in and mm -hmm. they need some turf grass, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's probably, you know, a big chunk, 50 to 60 percent of our business. And then the other portion of our business that we're continuing to try to grow is specifically for the homeowner. Yeah. Um, you know, we feel like we've got the stores, we've got the we've got the products and we've got the knowledge most importantly that those homeowners need mm -hmm. and we're willing to spend the time with them to actually get them the product that they need that's going to do best for them yeah so so what i've noticed seeing all the turf farms that i'm lucky enough to see and going over and visiting super is whilst it's a big company you can still see the genuine care for the customer mm -hmm. and the want to give knowledge is there i guess that's what set you apart sets you apart from a lot of others isn't it yeah I, I definitely think it does you know as we talk to some of our competitors you know they, they really don't want to be in that market and, and that's fine i mean they want to focus on sports turf or, or yep. whatever it may be and yep. that, and that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. We're we're happy to be in the markets that we're in and service the customers that we have. And and going specifically into turf varieties, I, I know obviously we spoke about the volume of turf that gets produced at a company like Superside. What's the impact that uh, the new cultivars such as Tiff Tough has had on the business. I know we've spoken before about this um, in other conversations that we've had, but Tiff Tough's been quite a significant part of the business for the last couple of years and it's grown quite a lot um, in a short period of time. Yeah, as I said before, it's a significant part of our business. It's from a volume standpoint, there's nothing that stands close to Tiff Tough from a sales volume standpoint. But to answer your question, on, on the production side of the business, um, we've seen huge changes from a from a turn, what we call turn standpoint. We're trying to turn those fields as quick as we can. Mm -hmm. And there's never been a turf grass that we've been able to turn as quick as we can turn a tiff tough field yeah, right. from harvest to growing it back in to get it ready for production again. Yeah. And then I would say for the consumer side, I mean, the water savings is a huge, massive benefit that's going to pay dividends down the road for the environment, mm -hmm. um, not not just for America, but for the entire world. Yeah. Um, as the as this turf grass specifically spreads throughout the world, like I believe it will. Mm -hmm. And and the climate that you produce Tiff Tough and all your other grasses in, so it's pretty unique from what I've found. Like in Australia, you're either you know you're either hot or you're either cold, but mm -hmm. you go to both extremes. So yes. you tell us a bit about Middle Georgia. Um, how hot and dry it can get over the summer months, but also I got a shock with how cold it actually get over winter. Yeah, so this is this is actually true for all of our farms, really. Um, the farms in North Carolina and, and Tennessee don't get quite as hot for an extended period of time, like uh, our farms in Alabama, Georgia, and, and South Carolina. Uh, we will see temps, you know, up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, sometimes above there. We don't sustain that for a long period of time, but what we do sustain for a long period of time is, you know, 92 to 98 Fahrenheit for long periods of time, for so weeks at a time. We're getting to mid to late 30s, I believe, there, yeah. Celsius. That's right. Uh, I think that's about right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Okay. Yeah, and then as far as the cold weather goes, like, like when you were there, I was showing you guys some of the frost damage that we had, uh, even in the tough, tough fields. Uh, we can get down to, you know, sustained for two or three days. 13 to 18 degrees which is like mm. negative nine yeah, celsius yeah. yeah 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 so we can we can get that cold and you know what's what happened this year is we had a three-day spell in december of 2022 where that happened and then it happened again in mid-march uh so we oh, actually wow. had a, we actually had a apart. we actually had a double hit and that was after we had already started to green up yeah okay um, so it just so smashes yeah. the turf straight yeah it, it can be it. it can be detrimental to the to the turf from a standpoint of, you know, you're green, you're moving, the engine's running again, and then you get hit like that, and it sets everything back significantly. So what happens to a warm season turf grass like Tiff Tough at minus nine? Yeah, so actually it's it's able to sustain, and it took it pretty well. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, all of the grass that we had that was mature, we, we didn't have any winter kill or winter damage or anything like that. Really the only damage we sustained uh, in, in the, any of the Tiff Tough fields were areas that had recently been harvested and that were completely bare. Yeah. They're really, really slow to come back this year. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. You know, where we can typically grow a tiff tough field in in four months during peak growing season. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of those fields are taking six to eight months to really recover. Yeah, right. Uh, so we did see some loss there. So what are the staff doing when it's minus nine outside? Yeah, so uh, you know, there's things to do. Uh, we have uh, really big pivots. Uh, yeah. As you know, you've seen yep. some of our really big fields. We've got fields that are over 250 acres. Yeah. Uh, so you've got an 11, 12 span pivot. Yeah. Uh, so we fill up sandbags and we uh, fix pivot tracks in the wintertime uh, oh, okay. in Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. Yeah. 
So <laughs> we, we, there's <laughs> always there's always something to keep us busy, yeah, along right. with a lot of maintenance and getting getting ready for the season. And on the uh, speaking of working and what you've actually got to do when you're cutting, would you say three thousand pallets or something like that? Are you, are you is it a twenty four seven operation? Is it or no no? Well, from yeah. a logistics standpoint, it obviously is to move that much turf. But from a harvesting standpoint, in peak season, our guys get started at five five thirty in the morning. Yeah, and they're typically finishing up. You know, around one or two, as long as nothing goes wrong as far as breakdowns. And that never like happens, that. does it? Yeah, it never yeah. happens. <laughs> so, Just on the busiest of days. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, and in terms of harvesting equipment, um, automatic harvesters, how many of them does it take to, to cut that much grass efficiently? Yeah, so we've probably got over 25 automatic harvesters. So that ranges anywhere from a Robo Max to a Firefly all the way up to a Trebro 3, um, which is our most efficient from a cutting standpoint. It's the fastest machine that we have. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, how many mechanics does that mean generally? Yeah, it takes a lot. It takes <laughs> a lot of mechanics to to keep all of that equipment running. I mean, if you could imagine twenty five harvesters running in a day, probably yeah. forty to fifty forklifts running in a day, yeah. something's going to break. Yeah. Uh, just in Middle Georgia alone, we have six mechanics on wow. our farm. It's okay. thirty six hundred acres, eighty employees, and we have six mechanics. Wow. And and f- just on a personal note for you, obviously you've you've come in into just external sales, and now you you getting closer to the sort of the, the top of the tree at a really big company. What's it been personally for you that's helped you sort of not just stay interested but also grow uh, yourself within the company? What are your sort of secrets to that? Yeah, I think, you know, just being curious for me, um, it, it, there's nothing wrong with folks that want to kind of stay in their lane and, and focus on one part of the business. I mean, what I, what I like about what I love about what I do is – I get to touch every little part of the business, if you will. Um, I work really closely with the finance team, with the IT team, just every aspect of the business. It's it's a lot of fun and it keeps it interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you learn so much working with the different departments of the company. Yeah, sure. So I, I think for me, it's not necessarily me. It's just being curious and, and learning yeah. from these other folks within the business. Yeah. Yep. So you're not just you're not just saying, hey, no, this is my job. Yeah. You're happy to learn everything and yeah, tell everything. Absolutely. And how much of a role is, um, has your your boss, Ben Copeland, played in, in that yeah, for you? Ben, yeah, as I said earlier, Ben's played a, a huge role in that. You know, it's, it's great work for him. He has an open door policy, which means, you know, if anybody has an issue, they just call him up. That could mm-hmm. be for me. That could be for the for the folks working in the office, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that open door policy is, is something that he's always had. And he's always more than willing to to share his knowledge and information that he has. And yeah. he has a plethora of oh, yeah. of knowledge yeah. when it comes to not only turf grass, but but how to run a successful, profitable business. Yeah. Um, no, he's incredible. He's yeah. probably the best in the business, if yeah. I had to say so. And that, I don't say that just because he writes my checks. I was going to say, we had to give him a plug, didn't <laughs> yeah. we? Yeah, it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's true. I, I say, ask anyone in the turf industry, and that's probably the answer yeah. I'll give you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and you've been in Australia now for a couple of days, four days, I think we said before. What have you? This is your first time to Australia, yeah, isn't it? First yeah. time. So yeah. what what's shocked you, and what's been exactly the way you thought it'd be? Yeah. So there's several things that uh, that have shocked me. Uh, the weather, for one, where, where we've been, mm. the weather's been amazing. Um, 75 every day for the high uh-huh. Fahrenheit. So yeah. it's it's beautiful. It's Is nice. that 23 Yeah, Celsius, we're about 22, like 23 that? at the moment. Yeah it's, yeah, it's been absolutely great. I would say one thing that, that I've really noticed in talking with a lot of the guys that, that run the farms, one thing that I, I've noticed is a really big difference is how tight you guys maintain your turf. Okay, um, yeah. I would say on the on the production side for you guys, I hear a lot of you know ten mil, mm-hmm. and that's that's below half an inch. Yeah, um, and we we just don't have that. But I, I understand that you know the smaller farms are geared towards you know sports fields, yeah. golf courses, things mm-hmm. like that. But it seems like they also produce it at that level for for the consumer. Well, our, our homeowners in Australia keep their grass a lot shorter than what yeah. they do in the US, particularly Tiff Tough. I got a shock yeah. seeing lawns inch and a half, two inches. Yeah, yeah that's pretty common. In the US. Yeah, I mean, we'll maintain it an inch and a quarter. Uh, sometimes What's it'll that, get away 35 from us. 35 mil, I yeah, think it is. 35, yeah, 30 mil. 40 mil yeah. on the farm uh, uh, for Tiff Tough. But for here, that would be very unusual, I yeah. think, based on what I've seen. Yeah. So that's that's been interesting to, to just talk with the other guys that are in the production mm. part of the business here in Australia. Um, that that are keeping it that tight because I mean that's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And so what's obviously we said the, the weather's been twenty two, twenty three. We are on the Gold Coast yeah. at the moment. Not all <laughs> Australia's like that at the moment. So where to next? Uh, what's your next couple of days look like while you're here in Australia? Yeah, yeah. So we're going to uh, Melbourne next. Mm-hmm. Going to visit a couple of farms there, and I think we've got a uh, tennis court uh, in the mix there as well. And yeah. then we're headed down to Sydney Beautiful. for a day or two. Beautiful. Yeah. And so good to see a lot. And Australian lingo. 
<laughs> so we, we get looked at pretty funny when we go to Middle Georgia yeah, and we visit yeah. and we open our mouths because a lot of weird things do come out. But, That's right. But what's it look like now? What, what, what's your favourite bit of Aussie lingo that you've picked up? Oh, yeah, it's got to be too easy. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Yeah, too easy. Too easy. Yeah. Nothing that's ever a, is. That's a great one. And Rido's pretty good too. And what? Rido. Rido. <laughs> Rido. We did a couple of Yui's last night in the van that's too, right, didn't that's we? Right. Yeah, yeah, we had some Yui's. We had some Yui's. Uh, and we won't go into what um someone we know was calling meat pies and sausage Yeah, we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do that. No one actually ever says that, so don't worry about that. So, um, yeah, the meat pies at the football game were definitely a hit. Yep, yep. We went to a rugby league game yesterday. It was yeah. a bit of an eye-opener for you, That wasn't was it? great. Yeah, that was great. Oh, that was good. That was good. So you finish here. You're back in the US. It's summer at the moment. So yeah. are you going to walk back into a firestorm, are you, or where are you going to walk yeah, back into most, when you get Yeah, most there? likely. We've got a lot of activity going on, a lot of expansions on the farm and things like that, and just trying to get stuff wrapped up. It's been really hot. We're in a drought right now, specifically in middle Georgia, so we'll we'll definitely walk back into the heat. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, for us, we typically go into what we call a summer lull in, in July and August. Those are the two hottest months of the year for us in the States, in the Southeast specifically, so we'll go into that summer lull. We're kind of in it right now. And then actually in September, once once folks are done with holiday or vacation yeah. and school's back in, we'll see a pretty good pickup of business, yeah. specifically where the cool season turf grass is sold in Tennessee and North Carolina. Yeah. So you know, from a logistics standpoint, we've got to get geared up for that again. Um, and then we're also, the, this time of the year, we start to look at inventory and things like that and what inventory are we going to have going into the fall dormant season mm-hmm. and really starting to budget and view what, what the spring of actually 2024 is going to look yeah, like. Sure. So, sure. yeah, so that's some of the work I've got ahead of me when I get back. That's if the place is still there when you get back. That's Who right. Knows? The wheels, oh, the wheels could have fallen off. No, yeah, it'll still be there. We don't know. Um, well, that's about it from us. We um, we really appreciate you uh, coming on the on the podcast and also coming to our country. Uh, yeah. you, you bring a wealth of knowledge with you, and um, yeah, I'm sure everyone's going to really enjoy listening to that. So thank you. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks for having me. Thanks.